Hello, hello, this is Joko, here to invite you to stay with me. I think it's safe to say that the video game industry is one of the foremost producers of creative content in the world. Composers, designers, writers, and artists from all disciplines put their time and effort in, and what we get out of it is, well... <laughs> So today, I'd like to take a look back at one creator's contributions to the ever-growing zeitgeist of interactive entertainment, which has taken him from grassy green debugger to director of some of the biggest games and franchises in the history of the industry. But more specifically, I want to take a look at him and what is possibly his most famous and or infamous role, a character designer. This is Artist Spotlight. Like any nascent weeb will tell you, Tetsuya Nomura made a big impression on me as a kid. Back then, I'd search Google Images to marvel at all the cool characters he made. As an adult and an artist myself, Nomura is a designer whose work I highly respect, not to mention have a lot of good memories of. Having cut his teeth at Squaresoft first as a debugger, then designing monsters, Nomura made his break with Final Fantasy VII. Now, you already know this game was destined to be a classic. The newest entry in the beloved series, and the very first to be presented to players in three glorious dimensions. And Amora was right on time. This was his first entry as the series' main artist, where he would oversee much of the creative and technical direction of the project, and most importantly, personally design every major character of the game. I'm sure you know our main protagonist too the giant sword-wielding super-soldier-turned-eco-terrorist-turned-hero, Cloud Strife, who would go on to become the poster child of the Final Fantasy franchise and reach the upper echelons of video game icons. What's interesting about Cloud, at least as far as Nomura as a designer, is looking back at every time he's redesigned Cloud over the years following Final Fantasy VII's original release. There's a clear continuum of Nomura refining his skills, testing his style, and changing his ideas about what his designs are actually designed to do. And these changes come into play in the variety of ways he's approached his characters over the course of his career. But before we get into that, I want to take a little digression for a lesson on the basics of character design. Like all design, character design is at least two parts problem solving. If a character exists solely in the void of negative space, they're allowed to be whatever they want. But when they're attached to a story with the world in a setting, their designs have to be anchored down to things outside of themselves. Every fictional character is one part of a thousand piece jigsaw. When designing a character, a large part of the design process is about making these pieces connect in a satisfying way. To accomplish this, there are four key ideas to keep in mind. Expression, grounding, function, and aesthetics. Expressive elements are meant to communicate some abstract idea to the audience through some design element they'll recognize. For example, if you want to quickly tell the audience your character is a superhero, toss them a cape. Nothing about capes literally says superhero, but the audience will understand through the sheer cultural ubiquity of superheroes with capes. The critical point of expressive design elements is that they rely on knowledge the audience brings with them, or at least have access to outside of the work itself. Like all symbolism, expressing ideas visually have varying degrees of cultural dependence. Just the colors white and black have wildly different connotations depending on who in the world you ask. It's always important to consider what connotations are being evoked and appropriately contextualize them. Grounding elements concern parts of the design meant to tie the character with the wider work they're in. Whatever the character shares with the world around them helps to tell you on a place, time, and on the story itself. Grounding elements might also be symbolic. 
But in this case, they rely largely on knowledge that's insular, meaning the audience understanding of that symbolism is communicated from within the work itself. Grounding elements serve to make a design and by extension the character themselves a small representation of a greater whole. Then there's function, which is concerned mainly with what the character can and will actually do. How much designers need to keep practicality in mind depends on a lot of factors. Overall tone, style, medium, etc. A gritty, down-to-earth war story will probably have characters in full tactical gear. A funny cartoon show, on the other hand, will have characters without pants pulling whatever they need right out of hammer space. It's all sort of a part of the overarching management of your expectations and getting them to suspend their disbelief, which is a whole other rabbit hole I won't go down right now. And when it comes to video games specifically, there's a whole technical side of this that's concerned with how the design interacts with gameplay mechanics. And finally, there's what the character actually looks like, their aesthetics. The final result of every design choice represented visually. Or it might be the other way around, where you started with an aesthetic and reverse engineered it into a fictional universe. Either way, the important thing to know is that the most successful design isn't necessarily the best looking design. Looking good is usually one of the goals you set out to achieve, but other design goals might supersede that one, or even invert it every once in a while. It should also be noted that these aren't at all mutually exclusive factors. Character designs and individual design elements are made to serve all of these purposes to some extent. And even though you might prioritize one idea over another, any decision made about each one affects the others. Every design process is different, but every successful character design finds the right balance to communicate exactly what you want to the people watching. Final Fantasy VII is a grim dystopian magic punk, and its characters reflect that through their design, and in particular their clothing and fashion design. The cast, for the most part, wears some pretty bland clothing. It's a world where great excess is relegated to a few places and times. Cloud himself is pretty drab, but not so much that he can't stand out. His spiky blonde hair and BFS are enough to identify him as our MC, but his dry, almost utilitarian clothes make him a character in a world where he has to travel through slums without looking too out of place. In universe, his clothes are a stripped down version of the uniform Shinra soldiers wear, a representation of his background as a washout of the evil mega corporation's super soldier program, one of the ways his visual design entrenches him as a person in the fantasy world. Moore's approach to clothing is easily the most talked about quality of his work. You see, it wasn't long after Final Fantasy VII that he had a dark addiction overtake him. That's right. Fashion. And he wasn't going to dispensaries. He was out in the streets, handing out $2 photo sessions just to score some visual K. Over the years, his designs would become much more heavily inspired by fashion. Primarily, hip-hop, emo, and other streetwear styles. His interests were pretty apparent in Final Fantasy VIII, where his characters would become much more stylish and extravagant. Squall, this installment's main character, wears a cool all-black jacket and pants combo with a little bit of jewelry and one of the earliest appearances of unnecessary belts in the franchise. Compared to the last game in the series, characters in Final Fantasy VIII have clothing designs that are much more layered and modern. 
but that doesn't mean fantasy was thrown out altogether. Ultimisha, the bad witch with mad bayonetta energy, has distinct fantasy elements while looking like she just stepped off of a runway in Milan. Final Fantasy VIII was an early sign of the direction Nomura's future design efforts would take, and by the early 2000s his influence within Square was unmatched. He was so powerful in fact that he survived a 1v1 elevator pitch with Disney and came out directing his own massive series of games. Even while Kingdom Hearts was being developed, he was hard at work on Final Fantasy X, the first entry of the series on the PS2, which represented another massive leap in graphical technology. It was the perfect storm for Nomura to put his designs into overdrive. Tenth Final Fantasy protag Titus is a somewhat infamous example of Nomura's style in this era. 3D rendering on the PlayStation 2 had the ability to depict far more detail than its last gen predecessor. And Nomura took full advantage. Unapologetically asymmetrical streetwear taken to over the top extremes, complete with feathered blonde hair that wouldn't look out of place on a member of a boy band. Titus's look isn't looked back on fondly by many, and honestly I can see why. It definitely feels pretty dated, and the individual elements, the black shorts and overalls, the colorful half jacket, the heavy boots, none of it really manages to come together and instead looks more garish and busy. This was the era of Nomura being as extra as he could, but credit where it's due. It was also the era of excellent designs like Oran and Yuna who take inspiration from traditional Japanese clothes. And then there's Lulu and Pain who are sort of goth, and I think we can all appreciate that. And even when it comes to Titus, there's a method to the madness. Besides being the protagonist, Titus is also a sports star. Being eye-catching comes with the territory. And in addition to being an expression of character and status, Nomura also uses fashion to demarcate different cultures and societies within the world of Final Fantasy X. Characters both playable and not have like or differing elements in their clothing, depending on their origin. After all, fashion in the real world is just a set of trends dictated by the needs or whims of any given group or society. When designing a fictional world, that world's wardrobe is a powerful tool. It will also give an individual character's look a contextual basis for their own self-expression. So as questionable as some of his choices may have been, it can't be denied that he helped create a distinct and living fantasy world. And now, that brings us to... If you walk away, you lose it. Firmly at the reins of this exciting new project, Nomura was more than keen to pour all of his accumulated experience points into Kingdom Hearts, but a crossover between the universes of Final Fantasy and Disney presented a unique challenge all the same. Designing and redesigning characters from varied stories and worlds into a cohesive whole would be a difficult task. Sora, Riku, and Kairi, three of the entirely new characters created for this series, represent a cross-section between the worlds of Final Fantasy and Disney, plus a heavy touch of Nomura. Sora's fashion is once again heavily inspired by streetwear, and like Titus, meticulously detailed with all the bells, whistles, and zippers he could ask for. Stylistically, Sora's design takes a different approach than Nomura's Final Fantasy characters to better pair with his Disney co-stars. Softer edges, smooth round lines, and bright colors make for a more cartoony look. And tonally, the more whimsical, innocent world of Kingdom Hearts allowed Nomura to test the waters with designs that really wouldn't work anywhere else. Cloud Strife reappears in Kingdom Hearts brushing shoulders with Heracles and James Woods. He looks ridiculous, cluttered, but against my better judgment, I genuinely love this design. Something about him just taps right into that part of the brain dedicated to deviant art. Without the usual constraints of a broad overarching setting, shared aesthetic, or a director to tell him no, Nomura seemed to focus on making him cool. Myself as an adult might second guess a few of his ideas. My younger self, on the other hand, aka the target audience, was completely awestruck by the single bat wing, the claw, and the big fucking sword wrapped in gauze for some reason. 
But even with all the extraness, it's arguably a perfectly successful design. A solid fit for the game it's in, and pretty cool looking besides that. At least it tricks your brain into thinking it's cool looking. There's a lot to be said about boldness and character design. Those memorable eye-catching elements that instantly set a character apart. They stick in your mind and retain your interest long after they've left the screen. Originally, Cloud had his spiky blonde hair and BFS. Either one of these are essentially synonymous with Cloud himself. Now, this Cloud has all that, in addition to a red cape, a single bat wing, either of which would serve as bold identifying elements by themselves. There are a lot of things here that demand your attention, and every time that happens, there's risk of none of it getting your attention at all. I think that's the core issue of Nomura's work in this era. The Final Fantasy VII spin-off game Before Crisis is the perfect counterbalance to end Nomura's era of extra. With a cast of characters who mostly wear the same men in black suits, it's interesting to zoom in on what parts of the designs distinguish them from each other. The whole reason anime hairstyles exist is as shortcuts to quickly distinguish characters from one another. Nothing wrong with that, but basics like shape and build, personality and demeanor, color and contrast communicate far more. At a glance, you can see the difference between the cool and relaxed knives and the serious straight-edged katana man. These are the fine details that really turn a design into character. Now rinse and repeat across the whole cast. It's pretty interesting to see Nomura work without what are usually his favorite tools. The World Ends With You was developed under the eye of its art director, Takayuki Yodachi, who chose to use an angular style to depict Tokyo's Shibuya district. The game's setting, which also happens to be the fashion capital of Japan. There was no other person to put up to the task of designing its characters but the illustrious Gen Kobayashi and Tetsuya Nomura. Here, Nomura's art takes a heavily stylized approach. Sharp, thick lines, hard angles give the game a look and feel reminiscent of graffiti art. Here, Nomura tackles fashion in a way that's much more toned down and streamlined. Unlike Before Crisis, the characters portray a wide range of styles, but The World Ends With You was another opportunity for Nomura's work to convey emotion and personality. Nomura returns to the Final Fantasy series with its 13th entry, and his work here is pretty damn good. By this point, it feels like Nomura has fully matured as a designer and artist. His characters are as meticulously accessorized as ever, but they're balanced in such a way that's much more cohesive and keeps everything from screaming for attention all at once. Fashion motifs in the world of 13 shift between class and society. From the people of Grand Pulse who wear furs, brightly colored beads, and drapery, to the citizens of Cocoon who dress in clothes with a more modern style. And then there are the elegantly ornate uniforms of Cocoon's noble elite. On the whole, I think it's fair to say that the designs of Final Fantasy XIII are really some of Tetsuya Nomura's best work. As if to bring everything full circle, in 2008, Square released the first entry of the Dissidia series, in which heroes and villains from across the Final Fantasy franchise could cross over and swing big swords at each other. And for such a monumental occasion, who else could do the character art but the man himself? With Dissidia, Nomura would have the opportunity not only to revisit characters he created in the past, but also characters crafted by other artists of the series, including his Final Fantasy predecessor, the legendary Yoshitaka Amano. This collaboration of style, decades in the making, would challenge Nomura to take Amano's otherworldly and dreamlike artwork from Final Fantasy's pre-3D era and render them in a solidified state without compromising the expressive imaginative forms and patterns that inspired them. 
and the results are beautiful. With his own designs, he takes the chance to re-envision them in ways that improve on the originals without sacrificing their established traits. The absolute madman actually made Titus work with a few subtle changes to his color palette and alterations that unify his outfit while getting rid of some of the more excessive elements. He doesn't take many liberties with Cloud's original design, but his style has matured considerably. His art is able to portray much more emotion, character, and complexity compared to his work in 98, a testament to his many years of experience and growth as a designer, artist, and creator. But before I finish here, who in the audience at Abbey Road Studios would like to hear Shimamura-san play a song for us before we go? <laughs> I know I would. Shimamura-san, if you'd be so kind, please. Uh... Playing us out was Apocalypsis Noctis, a suitably epic boss theme from Final Fantasy XV, arranged by the extraordinary composer Yoko Shimomura, and performed by the London Philharmonic Orchestra, along with Shimomura herself on piano. So, that was a good episode, wasn't it? Like and subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Bye.